Welcome once again to Along the Rio Grande. I'm George Torok, and today our guests are from the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum in Las Cruces, New Mexico. We have Bob Hart, who's the Curator of Interpretation, Cameron Saffel, the Curator of Agriculture, and Jane O'Kane, an oral historian. We want to welcome you to Along the Rio Grande. Thank you. Thank you, George. Be here. Some folks may not be familiar with the museum. Uh, maybe we should explain where it is and exactly what uh, material it covers. Tell us a little bit about it. Okay, George. Uh, the museum is a relatively new one. We've been open a little more than two years. Uh, we're at exit number one, a mile and a half to the east, exit number one off of I-25. It's University Boulevard. Don't head toward the university, head toward the mountains. 70,000 square foot building on 47 acres. We talk about 3,000 years of agricultural history for the state of New Mexico. And we actually uh, have a rather broad definition of that. We do include the El Paso area uh, because you were New Mexico for more or longer, many more years than you were Texas. So of course, uh, we do talk about your area as well. And what we're going to talk about today mostly is the uh, prisoner of war uh, project that's underway in the exhibit that's being prepared. What's the connection with agriculture and the museum? Well, the story is inherently agricultural because some 370,000 or so uh, German prisoners uh, taken during the first offensive Allied operations in the European theater, uh, basically in North Africa initially, uh, posed quite a problem. There were several hundred thousand, as I indicated, and the numbers would grow as the, the war lengthened and the Allies you know, came closer and closer to victory uh, against Germany and, and Italy. Uh, your problem was how close did you want them to the battlefronts? Uh, and many of them, uh, conscious decisions were made to, to ship them both to Canada, other British colonies, and, and, and the United States proper. And as I indicated, the United States proper got over 300,000 Germans uh, and additional Italians as well, although in substantially fewer, uh, lower numbers. Uh, the connection with agriculture is that once we had the prisoners here under the Geneva Convention, we were restricting how you could use the prisoners. They couldn't be used directly in war-related activities. And one of those things under the Geneva Convention, uh, it was determined that prisoners could do uh, were fairly harmless administrative tasks, uh, either with the, the military, and they performed those on military bases, or they could also be used in agricultural pursuits. Uh -huh. Okay, and now sometimes they're used industrially as well. But our particular focus, uh, because of the way the prisoners were used in New Mexico, is, is on agriculture, because they basically used them as, as gang labor to uh, pick cotton and, and work with other crops. Do we know how many prisoners of war were in this area during the war? Some 10,000 or more, but the, the, the problem with that figure is that the prisoners actually were highly mobile and were moved around. Oh. Some continually moved around, some were in stationary camps, and some were in multiple camps in multiple states. Uh, and one of the things we found out about telling our story is we couldn't just talk about New Mexico. We immediately got into El Paso and the camps down here, uh, which actually fed prisoners back into New Mexico. Uh, do we know roughly how many sites there were, or different camps? Were there uh, several big camps? Uh, okay, interesting question. In New Mexico proper, there are two big camps, one at Lordsburg and one at Roswell. Mm -hmm. uh, when we start to talk about Texas, we have to add two more major camps in that uh, we have to add both Fort Bliss uh, and Hereford, Texas, mm -hmm. okay, where there was a major camp. Uh, there was th about three satellite camps uh, here in, in uh, the El Paso area, and there are about 20 satellite or base camps in, in uh, New Mexico proper. Okay. How did the idea for an exhibit and oral history come about? Was there some event or a seed article or that that planted this idea? It's kind of a long-term interest on, on my part in that I, years ago I heard a story about an, a German prisoner who was so well treated in the United States that he came back home fat and unwilling to eat the food that his family was routinely eating. And I thought, gee, that's kind of strange. Prisoners of war treated so well that that people actually thought that they were spoiled mm -hmm. uh, as prisoners of war. Uh, when I started the job at New Mexico Farm and Ranch and we were looking for uh, exhibit ideas, one of those things that came to mind, obviously, was this POW story. And the interesting thing is that the more research we did, uh, Jane initially and then adding Cameron later, uh, we found out that the, the prisoners of war themselves, 
uh, and the folks who had had interaction with the prisoners of war generally tended to look back on this period in a positive way. So you're, not only did your prisoners of war have what could be called a positive experience, uh, in relative terms, sure. uh, but the the folks who had interaction with them, whether they be guards or whether they be children or whether they be workers at the camps or the farmers who actually employed them, generally also had a positive experience. And that's not what one would normally expect from prisoners of war. What kind of sources initially d did you take a look at? We'll get to the oral histories in just a second. Well, we were very fortunate early on to, we, we advertised uh, through some friends and whatnot in Germany, established some actual German prisoners to, to work with, used some surveys and, and questionnaires with them, and then, lo and behold, uh, in the local paper was a story about a gentleman who had run a red light. Uh, and the police had discovered that he did not speak uh, very good English, uh, but when they found someone who could interpret the German, he had indicated he had been a prisoner of war here. And I was sitting reading this article and said, oh my gosh, we have a German prisoner who was just dropped into our, our lap. And, and I went racing down and, and established some communication with him, brought him out to the museum. I, I speak some, some very rusty German. Uh, we got some other our volunteers who are very much more fluent than I am to assist on the translations. And it turns out that Walter Schmidt is his name. Uh, he was an Africa Corps member captured uh, when he was very young. Uh, and spent from 1944 through 46 uh, only uh, a time in Las Cruces. So I, he was at the Las Cruces camp, was a champion cotton picker. And Walter was, was an unusual individual in that not only did he have positive memories, but he had a diary and he had written for his family an account of, of his time as a prisoner of war. And I actually have some of those items sitting in front of me. Uh, so we, we started off really with a wealth of information and we've managed to spread out from there. And I should point out that Walter isn't the only one we were fortunate with. Perhaps Jane would like to say something about Rudy Potig, another prisoner we, we were fortunate enough to find. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about this, uh, the oral history aspect. Um, maybe we should uh, explain what an oral history is first okay. and then we can talk about some of the subjects. I usually explain it as a directed interview where you utilize a protocol or questionnaire and you're asking people to remember specific events or maybe processes. For an example, if you're asking someone how, how did they make uh, churn butter in 1910, for example. Um, and I think most importantly, you can also get at what people remember about what they felt and thought oh. about a particular time period or an event. So that's one of the advantages. But um, in getting back to how we first started with the project, sure. one of the very earliest interviews we did, um, Bob and I, with the county agent in Doniana County. And that was in December of 1996, which I think uh, points out how long we have been thinking and, and uh, talking about this project before we actually are at the phase that we are now where we're doing a lot of interviews. And the county agent had some experience in the war yes. years? Yes, the county agent was in some respects a gatekeeper between the farmers who needed agricultural laborers and the prisoners of war. So they were a very important component of how the project was managed uh, in New Mexico. And do you have a, a different method or different things that you're looking for when you talk to the prisoners or the people that deal with the prisoners? How, exactly. how is that different? Um, we actually have several categories of and we have specific protocols for each of those categories. We're going to be talking with, of course, the former prisoners of war, both Italian and Germans, the farmers and ranchers who employed them, and the farm laborers who might have worked with them. Oh. Um, we're, we want to talk with people who were camp guards, uh, maybe civilians who worked at the camps. We also want to talk to townspeople where the camps were located, because some of these were very small towns where the branch camps were located. And we have an interesting category where we're talking to people who were children during the war and trying to get at what they actually thought and remembered about their experience in relating to the prisoners of war. So yes, in each of those categories, we're looking for a little different kinds of information. And they can address different aspects of the, of the whole experience. Sure. And we talked about how one person just showed up one day. How do you generally locate your subjects, though? This well, was a long time ago. There are several ways. Um, of course, people we have interviewed for our other oral history projects in many of the communities in New Mexico, and they were aware of the project. So many have referred people to us. 
and then um, through news ar newspaper articles and radio shows we have some people who have, who have self-referred. Uh, one interesting time, uh, Bob was on the radio doing a, a talk about the POW project, and in the meantime, Cameron had a phone call from a woman on a cell phone saying, I remember this. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people, have, a number of people have self-referred. And then I think Bob should address um, how he has located some of the German POWs, because he's done a lot of specific work with both trying to locate Italian former POWs and Germans. One of the organizations we've uh, been working with, and I should uh, say that we're not doing this solely by ourselves. Sure. We have uh, other researchers assisting us. Wolfgang Schlauk, who's a retired uh, professor from Eastern Illinois University, who's a local Las Cruzen. Uh, Peter Buschdorf, who is a, a UTEP uh, PhD candidate, uh, also researching uh, POWs. Uh, we have uh, uh, Elvis Fleming over in, in Roswell. Uh, who has previously written uh, on the POW uh, topic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, assistance from Lordsburg. Molly Pressler is uh, assisting us in talking about the, uh, the camp there. Uh, I should also point out that there are various organizations that have ties to these countries, and, and we should get Cameron to talk a little bit about one of sure. the unique organizations that has to do with the Italian POWs. Uh, I've worked with your Italian uh, American Cultural Society here in, in El Paso uh, and, and Marvin Nicchio, uh to try and locate and, sure. and uh, old camps uh, and folks with memories uh, concerning the Italian POWs. But in terms of the Germans, Las Cruces has a sister German city oh, uh, in Nienburg, Germany, up in the, in the north. And it, it, you know, what would you think the chances that Nienburg, which is not a big city, has some former Las Cruces prisoners of war? Well, I went to talk to the, the sister city organization last month, and lo and behold, I wasn't there five minutes, and I had a name of a German POW who <laughs> had been in Las Cruces, and one of his friends had been in another New Mexico camp, wow. unspecified. That's one of those ways. Uh, we've worked with a group called the Papago Trackers. Uh, they, they basically are concerned with prisoners who were in the, uh, the German version of the Great Escape in Arizona, in Phoenix, uh, at a, a, a camp there in, in Papago Park. And the Papago trackers travel around, but they're, they're interested in this prisoner business, both Americans and Germans, and meet in both, on both continents. Uh, but the Papago trackers had someone call me again early last month, uh, and, and the uh, lady who had called indicated that she was going to Germany within a few days, uh, meeting with five former submariners who had all been at Roswell before they were transferred to Papago Park. Did we have some questions we wished to ask? <laughs> of course, yes, we did. Uh, so a, a lot of folks have been assisting us in this. It, it, it just hasn't just been ourselves. Locating and we'll come back to a few minutes how maybe some of our viewers might yes. be able to help yes. with the project. Um, before we talk to Cameron a little bit about what prisoners actually did, the oral histories that you're conducting, these will be transcribed? Yes. Uh, what is done with them? How do they tie to an exhibit? Of course, all of them are transcribed, and then once the transcription is completed, we will actually use excerpts from the interviews, both in audio-visual uh, components of the exhibit, as well as in label text, and then any publications we might do about the POWs in New Mexico, we might want to quote uh, different people that have firsthand experience. Sure. And I wanted to mention, too, that in, in relation to the Italians and German POWs who are still residing in Europe, we hope to be able to hire an, or, an oral historian in Europe to actually complete those interviews sure. for us, or perhaps we will uh, have Dr. Wolfgang Schlau mm -hmm. complete some of those interviews. So we have, uh, we have that aspect to deal with that's uh, a little different than our normal projects. <laughs> Great. Um, Cameron, maybe we can talk a little bit about exactly what the prisoners were used for, what kind of work they did, where, where they were. Well, uh, uh, our POW camps in, in New Mexico and West Texas were, were scattered uh, mostly across the southern part of the state, but uh, a few up through eastern New Mexico. Uh, being that most of them are in the Rio Grande and, and Pecos Valleys, a lot of these uh, POWs were employed to harvest cotton by hand. This is before a mechanical harvester was available. Sure. Uh, but in other areas of the state, some uh, workers up in the uh, Portales and Clovis area were hired to help with broom corn harvesting. Hmm. Uh, vegetable harvesting in the Albuquerque area was a uh, uh, major 
issue in, in, in that area. And uh, there was also some vegetable harvesting in the Roswell area. Uh, and uh, farmers could also hire them to uh, do just general farm work. Uh, we've uh, come across a couple of stories of guys that were just hired to stack hay in the barn. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, anything that a farmer needed that he could use several POWs for because uh, there were certain restrictions on you had to have a minimum number of POWs in order to uh, uh, be able to hire them. I see. Uh, then, you know, if, if you needed 15 POWs for something, you could do that early in the war. Later, those, those numbers were scaled down. Was there any compensation for this work? Uh, yes, POWs were uh, uh, given a, a salary of 80 cents a day uh, for their work. Now, uh, that was not the contract price that uh, the farmer paid. The farmer paid uh, the U.S. Army uh, whatever the local prevailing wage was for for the uh, the labor. So in uh, cotton harvesting, perhaps it might be a dollar fifty or two dollars per hundred pounds of cotton picked, if that happened to be the prevailing wage that the farmers had set in the area. And that money went to the U.S. Army, and they paid eighty cents of that to the POWs, and that was paid in in script basically, which the POWs could either save up or they could use at the local uh, PX at the POW camp and buy. Uh, certain supplies or maybe get their picture taken if they were in a major camp where there was a camera. <laughs> um, and some folks just diligently saved it away and, and they got cash at the end of the war when they were sent back to Europe. And so some POWs went back uh, fairly uh, relatively wealthy men considering the they profit. did a POW camp <laughs> for two years. So. Sure. Uh, what was the reaction to the local community when they found out that uh, POW labor was available? It, it depended on, on the time and, and place uh, a lot of times, and sometimes who the prisoners were. Hmm. Uh, in uh, Doniana County, uh, it was one of the earliest areas in the state to be strapped by labor problems. So as soon as they could get POW laborers, uh, farmers were all in favor and said this is a godsend because at times these laborers were the difference between cotton sitting in the field and rotting sure. and getting some of it out. You know, we, we, we shouldn't proclaim the, the POWs as, as uh, uh, extraordinary cotton pickers, <laughs> but uh, they, they, they did do a, a very good job and, and would pull out a significant bunch of cotton. Uh, as a contrast, in the Albuquerque area, the, the first POW camp in Albuquerque was to hold Italians, and it was set in, a, in an old civilian conservation corps camp that was in the city of Albuquerque. When plans were announced that the Italians were to be pulled out and replaced with Germans, the local residents got in an uproar because here we were going to have German POWs across the street from residences and things. Oh. And that resulted in the camp being removed outside of Albuquerque to a, a, a farmstead south of town. Once uh, POWs were working on a farm or working in a community, did people get used to them? Were the relations generally good? It, again, it depends a little bit on, on what was, uh, who was employed and what was going on. Once they had some contact, though? Once they had some contact, and depends a little bit on, on uh, who was employed. We uh, have an interesting story in the Roswell area where uh, a family would actually sit down with the POWs and, at lunchtime and and talk with them, and this was basically against the, the Army policies that the yes. prisoners were not supposed to fraternize with uh, uh, employers and vice versa. Uh, and in this particular case, with one family in the Roswell area, the FBI was called in to investigate. Oh, really? Uh, I do think some of the farm families took the non-fraternization uh, policy quite, yes, quite seriously. Yes. And, you know, really did try to keep the uh, children, for example, at a distance and, mm -hmm. and very careful about uh, following those rules. And yeah, we have other indications that people sometimes set out food for the POWs who they felt sorry for. Other people felt resentment because the POWs they felt, for instance, wasted food that they couldn't get uh, because it was rationed. And one of those examples mm -hmm. was coffee, that they always had coffee for lunch. And this is one of those things that uh, normal American citizens found hard to get. I heard a very interesting story in an interview I did earlier this week with a woman who was about maybe 10 years old during the war. And she described how she always looked forward to watching when her father drove in the truck, you know, drove the truck in with the POWs each morning. And she remembered very clearly one morning where they stopped at the end of the sidewalk and they handed her four oranges. Mm. And I'm sure oranges during the war were quite a delicacy and give some indication of what was available for the POWs, at least at that particular point in time.
And I said to her, wasn't that a, a delicacy given that you sometimes only got oranges at Christmas? And she said, oh, yes, I ran with them in my arms to my mother to show, <laughs> to show what I had received. So. so people really weren't supposed to mix with the prisoners, but do we find a number of examples where they yes. built different types of relationships with them? Yes, and sometimes that the prisoners come back and become American citizens or request that their former employers become sponsors yes. for them when they come back to the United States. That's one of the questions I like to ask people who were farming and ranching in those in, during World War II. You know, how sensible was that policy of, of non-fraternization given the conditions on most farms and ranches where, you know, the farmer had to come out and describe to the workers how to do a particular task. Sure. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I was talking with a woman last week and she described how for special treats she would make up a big pot of beans and burritos for the POWs because they did feel this uh, kindness toward them that they were really helping them in some pretty straightened conditions that they were in for labor so I don't know that that particular policy was followed very closely but some really did try to to follow those rules. How did the prisoners get along amongst themselves? Was there conflict at times? It would depend again a little bit on the camp. Most of sure. the camps were, were uh, sort of designated depending on the type of uh, uh, philosophy, if you will, of, uh, of individual soldiers. So some camps were uh, severely pro-fascist or pro-Nazi. Others were just sort of the, the, the ho-hum uh, general Nazi soldier who was just happened to be in the army type. And uh, in a camp where there was uh, a combination of any of these, there could be some conflict when uh, the no really strong Nazi uh, soldiers were going around and, and maybe beating up on some of the, the lesser uh, uh, philosophical soldiers uh, saying, why are you out doing this work and things sure. like that. So they were seen as really collaborating by helping out with the harvest or that and there were conflicts that developed because of and, that. And even worse, it could be that from time to time there, there were folks that were labeled as collaborators, either because uh, uh, in Rudy Potig's case, he was a, can uh, a, a translator and uh, uh, supervisor, oh. and because he worked more frequently with the American uh, Army than he was sometimes uh, seen as a questionable soul as to what he's been doing up there. So. Ah, have we found some interesting material besides the uh, interviews and that? What kinds of things have we come across as we've been researching this? I understand the diary that you mentioned. What, what we, kinds of things do we learn from the diary? Well, one of those things uh, that uh, Walter Schmidt records is that when he arrived, the camp had formerly housed Italians, and there was no wire around the camp. Hmm and that they hadn't been there three days and up went the wire and the watchtowers. So again, this different perception of Germans and Italians. I was gonna point out one other thing. Uh, we talked a little bit about how initially people might have thought about the prisoners and then kind of at the end how they thought about the prisoners. And it might be wise to suggest that in some counties there were more prisoners in some of the large camps than there were people in the county. Oh, really? And that, so one of those initial concerns was security. Uh, at, towards the end, however, uh, the army actually relaxed the ratios of, or increased the ratios of, of prisoners to guards. Uh, some prisoners were not always supervised uh, towards the end, uh, could actually get a work detail and, and not have a guard. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in actuality, the prisoners were kept after the war was over, and there was some agitation to keep them from even longer. They were kept <laughs> into 46 uh, because the, the labor crisis was still real. Right. You know, GIs hadn't returned to the field. I understand that some of them wrote letters uh, home, uh, things uh, that... Uh, if, if we could uh, get at the, the, the censored letters. Sure. Uh, the censored letters are interesting, I think, because they're censored on both ends. There's an American uh -huh. censor uh, blacking out items, and then there is a stamp from one of the German offices in the army, of the, the Wehrmacht there, where they actually censored the letter as well. So Walter, for instance, a future wife, kept the letters that he wrote to her and those are one of the things that we will put on display. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, timetable for the project uh, and the exhibit. Uh, when can we look forward to the exhibit and how does the whole history process tie into that? Well we have a lot of interviews that we're going to do, 77 uh, that we have identified at right now and possibly more when this airs and we're hoping to uh, 
work with the interviews through September and then have them all transcribed by November of this year. And of course, then the process will start in, in combing through the interviews and, and choosing those parts that we want to use. Hopefully, and more than hopefully, we will have the interview opening January of 2002. Oh. And Cameron, you might want to speak to the, some of the scholarly activities. Uh, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to line up uh, a program to coincide with our uh, opening of our exhibit to bring in some of the, the prisoners themselves. Uh, to uh, talk about their experiences, uh, to bring in scholars and perhaps have a scholarly conference that discusses the POWs in, in the United States uh, and place the New Mexico story in a greater context. Sure. Uh, while our story is, is uh, a unique collaboration and, and brings a, a lot of things together for this exhibit, it's a very similar story for other states throughout the United States. If people uh, have some information or they think they might know someone that uh, could help with your project, uh, what kinds of things are you looking for? Or who should they contact? Well, the rarest things are photographs ah. of, of the prisoners, uh, either at work or in that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we're interested in other artifacts. Uh, we know that prisoners made toys, made items they traded to people. Uh, to raise money to buy band instruments and this sort of thing. So there are items that, that prisoners uh, actually made during that time frame. We'd be interested in, in seeing those and putting those on display. And specifically, if there's anyone listening today who was a, a camp guard or a civilian who worked in the camps, we'd be very interested in talking with them or anyone who worked with Italian POWs. We would very much like to have additional information on Italian POWs. And they should get in contact with you folks at the yes. museum, and you can steer them to the right uh, people and yes. conduct those uh, interviews. 505-522-4100. I think we can put the uh, address and phone number on at the end of our uh, program today. Well, it's certainly a fascinating topic, and we want to thank you, Cameron and Jane and Bob, for coming in the studio today and telling us a little bit about prisoners of war in our area. And we look forward to the exhibit uh, about two years or so ahead. And we hope to uh, enjoy a lot of this information that you're gathering through those uh, oral histories. And we want to encourage our viewers, if they have any information, uh, to get in touch with the folks here on our panel. And uh, hopefully, we can play a role in developing that exhibit. Thank you for coming in the studio today and uh, being with us. And we want to thank all of our viewers as well for joining us today on Along the Rio Grande.